Good evening, and welcome to the Jacksonville Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee. If um, you would like to look at the agenda provided and review that. I'll give everyone some time to review. And if we can get a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt it. There is a second. Okay. Uh, the uh, agenda has been adopted. Uh, next, we have the minutes. If we can review that. I motion to adopt the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our minutes. Oh, can we vote, please? Yes, oh, yes. All, Sorry. all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Nays. Uh, nays. nays. <laughs> <laughs> Any nays? <laughs> okay, our um, minutes have been adopted. Uh, next, we'd like to go to a committee and Glenn. Um, this is the time at the that you elect a chairman and vice chairman um, at the Provision in um, the um, page 11 in your agenda is that portion of the city ordinance that um, compels you to do so, um, to select someone to be there. As you note, the, you can serve two successive one-year terms as chairman, um, and then someone else has to do it, <laughs> as it is there. So the floor is, um, uh, we have to elect both the chairman and a vice chairman. The floor is now open for nominations for chairman. I make a motion that we that I nominate Suzanne Nelson as chairman and Sarah Holden as vice chairman, please. Okay. A joint motion has been made. A uh, <laughs> ticket has been formed, and um, it's, um, it's the ticket of Suzanne Nelson and Sarah Holden. Um, are there any other nominations? If there are no other... I was thinking about Sarah uh, nominating her as... Uh, President. You want to nominate Sarah as chairman? Yeah, chairman. Chairman. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so we have now um, we have a motion to elect um, Suzanne as chairman and a mo and and Sarah as vice chairman. And now we have also a motion to elect Sarah as chairman. I want to send that and say vice. Okay. Sorry. All right. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So so. <laughs> All right, so now, if there are any other nominations, okay, well, there being none, is there someone who wishes to make a motion that we elect um, Suzanne Narelson as chairman and Sarah Holden as vice chairman by acclamation? Okay, we have a motion and a second, a motion made by Grace, a second by Austin. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any nays? There being no nays, um, you all are elected, and this is a good thing. So, Ms. Grace will convene the rest of this meeting, and the new um, officers will take effect at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Well, since um, I'm already talking, <laughs> this is part of your program that you have. Remember, we have put previously provided to you, and it's over here on the next page, how it, during each month that you are meeting um, that we give, it's at the bottom of page two, um, how we're providing you with information about, um, about things in the community that have a connection, that were things in the city, excuse me, that have a connection to clean and green. And the first up this evening is someone that's no stranger to you all, is um, Lily Gray, um, who is also staffed to the committee and um, is the community development administrator. And so she's going to be wearing that hat this evening and tell you about some things that she is involved in. Hi, good evening, everyone. And we thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. We enjoy coming every year to update you on what's going on in the world of community development. Um, as many of you know, community development is a HUD-funded program. We call it CDBG for short. We receive an annual allocation of community development block grant funds, approximately $343,000 a year, down from a, a high of approximately six hundred dollars about 10 years ago. So significant budget cuts, um, but we still try to do the best we can with what we have. With that funding, we are required to address three national objectives, benefit low and moderate income households or persons, elimination of slum and blight conditions, and addressing urgent needs. And that's a rare category. Hopefully we'll never have to use it. That's a disaster. Your hurricanes, 
floods, things of that nature. But the one that you are most interested in that speaks directly to this committee's work is our slum and blight um, elimination. So far in the last five years, we've demolished approximately 90 buildings throughout the city. We have a goal of hitting 100 next year, and when we do, we will have a big celebration. <laughs> you all will be invited to attend. We also um, work strategically. Um, all of our funding can be used citywide. Resident meets our income guidelines and qualifies for one of our programs. As long as they live in the city limits, they can um, benefit. Those programs that typically um, citizens will qualify for are residential rehabilitation program and our uh, down payment assistance. That's important to you because what we do with our residential rehab also affects appearance of neighborhoods and homes and conditions to the extent that we can improve them. In some cases, we've demolished them and replaced them with new homes. So that's a clean and green benefit. And then we also um, have been strategic in working in our downtown. Many of you have gone down there, Court, Newberry, Ford, and Poplar Streets, where we've um, demolished probably 12 homes down there and reconstructed, I believe we're at seven or eight so far, and have new homeowners in the area, beautiful new homes, custom homes, so we're proud of that. And then, of course, one of our big goals, which we um, would love to see revitalized, is New River. And we are constantly looking for opportunities and partnerships and speaking with property owners and developers about how we can transition that neighborhood and bring it back to, to life. We also recently implemented, actually it's been a year, July of last year, in response to some of your comments that you provided during the um, advisory board summits where you met with city council back in December of 2014. Some of the feedback we, we received, which was one priority, is that we needed to look at older neighborhoods. There's a feeling, perception that the city does a lot in the newer neighborhoods and that may or may not be always true because developers do a lot in the newer neighborhoods, but because uh, improvements follow development, if there's no development in older <coughs> neighborhoods, we felt like we did need to provide some attention. So Office of Livable Neighborhoods was created, and we are partnering with our neighborhood organizations to approve neighborhoods. And what that looks like is our office, which is myself and Car Carmela George, which many of you know, serve as sort of the front door for citizen engagement with the city. We work with registered neighborhood organizations, whether they're existing organized neighborhoods or if we need to help them to organize. And in the, in within that strategy of communication, we're able to connect them with the various city departments and provide a coordinated response. So code enforcement, utilities, transportation, street sanitation, all of the typical departments that affect neighborhoods and whether they feel like they're getting the services or not. We're kind of helping um, communicate on their behalf, advocate <coughs> on their behalf, help them learn how to advocate for themselves, prioritize, and then provide customer service, timely responses back to the neighborhood. So those are the, that's the new initiative that we're excited about. And Glenn asked me to keep it short and sweet, so I'm now going to turn it over to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Gary Willett. I'm the Chief Zoning Code Enforcement Officer for the City of Jacksonville. We fall within the Community Development um, Division under the Development Services Department. Code Enforcement is responsible for the functional areas of public nuisances, which are your high grass, weeds, trash, debris, uh, noxious odors, and those types of nuisances. Not so much your animal nuisances, which are handled by the Onslow County Animal Control. We also enforce that portion of the code which deals with junk vehicles. Those are vehicles that are inoperable, uh, not licensed or insured, uh, and create a blight and a danger uh, with regard to uh, hazardous spills, and those types of uh, violations. Along with what Ms. Gray said earlier about the demolition of housing uh, and eliminating slum and blight, the code enforcement division <coughs> also does minimum housing. It's not always to the extent where we will bring a case to Ms. Gray for demolishing a structure, but we work with tenants and landlords specifically the tenants who have concerns about 
uh, the dwellings that they're leasing, a landlord's not maintaining to a proper standard that's established by the North Carolina State Building Code for plumbing, electricity, heating, air, and the structure in and of itself. So we handle all of those complaints to ensure that we get uh, compliance from landlords to maintain the dwellings in a minimum standard of habitability which is safe and sanitary for the tenants. That also includes your non-residential or commercial structures. Those same codes for residential dwellings apply for commercial dwellings. The zoning enforcement uh, functional area we do is our land use regulations. When a developer gets a, a building permit to erect a structure, do development, once site plans are approved, the code enforcement section is charged with uh, conducting periodic inspections until the site is complete to ensure that it complies with all the regulations and standards for development which are established in the Unified Development <coughs> Ordinance that Ryan King will go over here shortly. The process for code enforcement involves uh, two phases, either complaint driven, uh, which is reactive. Uh, we get many, many citizen complaints, but the code enforcement section also tries to be proactive. If we receive a complaint at 815 Newbridge Street, when we're in the area on Newbridge Street, we don't just go to that site, address that issue, and leave. If we see other code violations which we require addressing, we address those at the same time. So we try to be proactive. We will do uh, sweeps of entire neighborhoods uh, periodically to ensure compliance with the codes, with the high grass, weeds, trash, debris, and those things. When we receive a complaint, we act on a complaint within 48 hours. More often than not, we can address it on the very next day. Once we receive a complaint, if the uh, residence is occupied, we will attempt to make contact with the resident. If not, we will post a notice on the door telling them what their violation is, what their corrective action needs to be taken in a specified period of time normally three to five days to abate the violation. If they fail to do so, when we go back for an inspection, then a certified notice of violation is sent not only to the tenant, if it's tenant occupied or if it's owner occupied, to the property owner of record from the Onslow County property card. And that's an official notice notifying them that if the violation is not corrected again within a specific period of time, then the city will take further enforcement action as specified by the code. So you can tell already at this time, we've been to a property twice. When we go back on the third time, it's to, uh, if the property is not abated, then we go to the magistrate's office, get administrative warrants, we have contractors that are on a rotation schedule, and we will get an administrative warrant, go on the property, abate the violation, and then penalties are assessed to the property owner, owner of record, uh, whatever the contractor's fee is, plus a $200 administrative fee, which is established by the city council in the fee schedule, which uh, covers the staff time, the the photos, the documentation, that's all involved. So from start to finish, any one complaint could take three to, three to four site visits as well as a lot of paperwork in order to obtain compliance. Now I will tell you we have three code enforcement officials in the code enforcement department, myself and two others. In 2015, we did 2,410 cases. Uh, of those 2,410, we actually only had to get 153 warrants to go on property to abate. Now, 153 may seem like a lot of warrants, but when you're doing 2,500 cases, 
we we feel we're doing a pretty good job at getting compliance from the property owners and the residents. So we're, we're happy with those numbers, although you can see a lot of properties <coughs> this time of year that need addressing and we get to them as fast as we can. The zoning side of the house where we do the land use inspections for developments and uh, renovations, uh, we did 969 of those inspections. So we stay busy, but it's all for the good of the residents of the city. Here's some examples of high grass and weed nuisances. The city code says any property, occupied or unoccupied, that's developed, uh, if grass and weeds is over eight inches in height on average for the property, then it's a violation of code. A yard full of a few dandelions is not in itself a violation of code. If the entire yard is covered with dandelions and weeds and it's over eight inches in height, then in fact that is a violation of code. Mm -hmm. Trash and debris, unfortunately these are examples of actual cases that we've handled in the, in the past, but we've obtained compliance one way or another. Um, some of your other nuisance codes, stagnant water, uh, things that would breed mosquitoes, uh, attract rats, snakes, and other vermin. Uh, this is all items that either are brought to our attention or we come upon. A junk vehicle, as I talked about before, is any vehicle that is inoperable, partially dismantled or wrecked, and cannot be self-propelled uh, as it's designed. Uh, vehicles in and of itself is not just your cars or trucks, but anything that has a motor. Boats, campers, trailers, jet skis, all of those are considered vehicles by definition. Some examples of your junk vehicles. Your minimum housing code, again we talked about structural integrity, your plumbing, your mechanical and electrical heating and air, <clears throat> sanitary conditions and life safety issues are all issues within the code that we inspect and address to ensure compliance. Some uh, examples of deteriorated or dilapidated structures, uh, the one in the upper left has been demolished uh, by the city last year, year before last, and you know, Ms. Gray talked about wanting to hit or hoping to hit 100 homes by this year, and we've got 90 plus, but we already have several in the works, but the process to, from start to finish for getting a house taken down, the legal process, the documentation and everything else takes many, many months, especially if it's air property and to track down all the people and all the financial institutions that may have liens on a property. You can't just go take down a building on somebody's property without their knowledge or consent. So, and that's what I have for code enforcement. And again, I thank you for having us. If you see things in and around town that you feel we need to address, by all means, please don't hesitate. Call, send an email, the, it'll get to us and we will address it as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My, for those of you that may not know who I am, my name is Ryan King. I'm with the Planning and Permitting Division and uh, our office is responsible for basically all of the things that go into prior to development. So when a development is proposed, we review the plans to make sure that they comply with the city codes. And then we also permit those activities. <clears throat> After it begins construction, we're kind of out of the, the, um, the loop, if you will, as Gary mentioned. They check to make sure that the zoning compliance is uh, finished at the end of the process. <coughs> the building inspectors that are also part of our department, 
they actually go out to inspect the buildings as they are constructed. Now, the planning and permitting staff do schedule those inspections for both Gary and his staff and Danny and his staff. Tonight, I thought that I would go over a couple of items that um, kind of key in on the appearance part uh, and also the environmental part. And tonight, I thought we'd start with the sign regulations. Signs, obviously, are visible items that we see in the community and city council last month, I believe it was, made some changes to the ordinance. Uh, that was a result of a sign committee that uh, Ms. Williams sat on and um, uh, Mr. Saunders was on there as well. <coughs> and uh, we met uh, three or four times and went over some proposed changes, um, had that endorsed for the most part by the sign committee in its entirety, brought that forward to city council and it was adopted. So I'll go over some of those um, highlights here now. Uh, this is a development entrance sign at the mall. Uh, the old code basically st um, stated that there needed to be a four inch minimum letter size on the sign. Uh, the committee and staff felt it was best that we just eliminate that, primarily because the if you look at the sign here, um, and I'll use the Ulta Beauty Supply Company, Ulta is what they want the customers to see. And, and you may be difficult to see, but it actually says beauty underneath that and it's not four inches in, in height. So if that requirement of four inch had to be there, then it wouldn't fit in terms of the size and the scale of the sign. So we felt it was best to eliminate that standard from, from the ordinance. The only place that it was in our ordinance was with these development entrance signs. And, and a development entrance sign is something where you have multiple tenants at a site versus say a McDonald's that has their own single freestanding sign that wasn't even applicable. So this kind of even the playing field for both, both type signs. Uh, the next change that we made uh, to kind of even the field there is the uh, electronic message centers. So with the multi-tenant sign here, 50% of that sign could be electronic message centers. The freestanding for say the McDonald's or the Walgreens could only be 30%. We basically modified that so it's 50% for both parties. So that way we don't have to say, well, is it a multi-tenant sign or is it a single? It's pretty much 50% across the board. Another big change that, that um, happened at the request of a lot of the business owners that uh, now that this technology is becoming a little bit more affordable and um, studies have shown you know, it increases their sales, they ask that we reduce the, um, the frequency in which <coughs> it could change. The old ordinance stated it could only change every 29 seconds. So the new provisions allow it to change every eight seconds. It still does not allow transitions or animations. So if you see those, then that's a, one of the cases that Gary was just talking about, one of those thousand zoning cases that, uh, actually that may be part of the, the 2400 number. So um, now that's going to allow them to um, more frequently change uh, their advertising on that board. And it's in line with DOT, the LED billboards, that DOT allows is eight seconds, so it, it mirrors that same standard. One other item that we did not have that the new code adds is a provision for a maximum luminosity. We really haven't experienced a problem in Jacksonville with our LED boards in terms of the brightness, but just in case we have you know, a business that, that turns the volume up, if you will, on the brightness, um, we have now have a standard of a 0.3 foot candles above ambient light, and that's that's taken from the industry standards. That's the best way to measure um, the foot candles there. One other item that we, we pointed out in the ordinance is to avoid white backgrounds. And the primary reason is to get white, basically the, the LEDs are turned to their maximum strength. And um, we've had some complaints in the past of a white background that was fairly low to the ground that when it changed from say a green background to a white background, that it was startling drivers because they thought that a car was getting ready to broadside them pulling out of the driveway. Mm -hmm. So um, we think that this luminosity limit is needed uh, just in case, in case something comes up. And that's what was adopted uh, by city council last month. Wall signage, we really didn't change the calculations any at all. We did, however, provide specific guidance that anything placed in the windows is part of signage. There was an exemption before for temporary signs. Well, the question always is, well, what's temporary? If something goes up there and it's there all year long, is it temporary just because you can peel it off the glass? 
So because the two square feet for the front elevation is a very um, liberal number, we've, we've had that said uh, by many, many sign companies, local and those from out of town, that two square feet for the front elevation is, is a plenty of signage allowed. And I'll give you an example of one of the reasons why we kind of <laughs> talked about this. These signs here are not permanent signs, so none of them were permitted, but they're also supposed to be temporary. So this, this business here, let's say they're allowed 50 square feet of signage, they've got 50 on the building, then all of this is extra above and beyond the ordinance allowances. So to give you an example of, yeah, I've got an example here in just a second. So another example is the PetSmart Gateway Shopping Center. Um, it's just kind of a clean look. So as far as an appearance goes, um, you have this that some may find not so attractive versus something that's a little bit more clean. So to give you the example, we, the way that we kind of factored this in is the Bojangles is basically 52 feet wide. That means they're allowed 104 square feet of signage on the front wall here. So basically you see the Bojangles and the stars on the front facade. That's all I'm talking about right now. So the building width at 50 feet gives them 100 square feet. So the sign and the stars combined is 56 square feet. That means they have 43 square feet of additional space. So they want to add their specials. This is the temporary signs that are now going to be factored in as part of just wall signs in general. It's no longer going to be temporary. So three, th um, sorry, three of these signs at um, their 12 square feet apiece, 36 square feet. So they still have roughly seven square feet that they could add on the building. So we think that that was, you know, a good formula to try to maximize the number that also deals with the window signage. It also allows when somebody comes in and asks staff, you know, how much signage can we have? It's pretty much whatever your facade is, you get two square feet. Another change that we made was dealing with the directional signs. We did not have a maximum height. So in theory, somebody could build one that's 20 or 25 feet in the air. Didn't think that that would look very well, so we wanted to go ahead and cap that at a four <coughs> foot height maximum. It was already four square feet in area. We also defined that these signs can be located on either side of commercial driveways as defined by our code. Another item that had been um, coming up and many people had kind of voiced some concerns was the, the flags, especially the feather flags. So the ordinance already outlined that you could have flags that could be displayed indefinitely as long as they remain in good condition. It also stated that they could not be placed or encroach into the right-of-ways. Obviously, we don't want a flat feather flag, flag falling down on a car as it's going by on, say, Western Boulevard and damaging the vehicle. So the steering committee came up with basically two standards, one for a standalone site, such as a McDonald's, I'll pick on McDonald's this evening, or one where you have a multi-tenant space uh, shopping center. So for the McDonald's example, for every 50 linear feet of street frontage, you can have a feather flag. So if you have 200 feet of frontage, you get four feather flags. That's the max. Old code, you could have as many as you want. There was not any limitations on the flags. On the multi-tenant sites, we have a lot of tenant spaces that are only 20 feet wide. So the steering committee wanted to make sure that we provided a provision so that every single tenant would be allowed to have at least one feather flag. So we applied the same standard of one flag for every 50 linear, linear feet of building facade for the multi-tenant sites. However, a minimum of one per tenant space. So similar calculation, but also different. It provides for every tenant to have at least one flag. The next thing I wanted to talk about with the unified development ordinance that was adopted by city council back in 2014, the city of Jacksonville uh, adopted building design standards. Now the standards we adopted are fairly basic and simple, but I'm going to give you an example of what the non-standard kind of the way that the building could look versus um, following the new design standards. So um, the Coles, which was constructed before the road backed up to the parkway, um, you can see here on the building that there's no glass on the back wall. 
Um, pretty much just follows their standard color scheme. And you can see the large rooftop air conditioned units on top of the building. So that was prior to design standards. With our new design standards, you can see quite a bit of difference in the way that this building's appearance is just next door to the Coles. You can't see the rooftop units because all rooftop mounted equipment has to be screened from any street view. We also have a 12 or 15 percent glazing requirement for the building depending on the size of the building. And we also require that they pick three options from a menu of choices that helps break up the, the wall. So vertical accents that you can see here where it's got kind of the darker tan uh, and there's a little bit of a projection. And then with the loading dock, there's a projection there. There's a three-piece cornice at the top of the building. And they've also kind of changed the paint scheme. It's not just one solid color. So they have an option, uh, a menu of options that they can use. They just choose three. And they add those to the building just to kind of dress up the building. So that's something that we see today with the new design standards that we didn't see prior to 2014. And I think that uh, as you've seen and you will continue to see that um, the buildings will begin to look a little bit nicer than maybe some did in the past. That doesn't mean all buildings in the past didn't look good. It's just without having that standard, uh, you could have a big box come in that didn't have any glass on the building whatsoever except for the front door. Uh, another change that was adopted before the Unified Development Ordinance that we can now see kind of um, what that looks like the example that we're going to use here is the, the restaurant at, at the Parkway in Western. And if you notice, there's not a whole lot of landscaping next to the sidewalk. And that's because the city of Jackson required eight-foot street lawns, but we didn't require any landscaping to go in that area. That is up until about 2012 or 2013 when we brought forth um, changes to the landscaping section that required landscaping in those street lawn and perimeter lawn areas. And I'm going to give you an example of some of those. Um, this is in front of the Carolina Ale House and the Panera Bread. You can see you've got the sidewalk and the street lawn, and they've got a nice hedgerow and trees uh, along that, um, that street lawn. Much different and a much better appearance um, along the street lawns. And I've got a couple examples. I'll just kind of go through those slides. Uh, the, the, the steakhouse here where, you know, once again, a lot of landscaping along our corridors there. That provides kind of a, a breaking point between the asphalt and, and the, um, the highways, just to kind of give it a little bit better curb appeal. <clears throat> um, and to end this evening's kind of discussion, just thought I'd kind of share with you two things. Um, some recent developments, obviously I'm sure all the, the group members here are well aware of the developments that have recently opened, the new Verizon, Burlington Coat Factory, uh, Moe's Southwest Grill at the Mall, the Osprey Grill, Rack Room Shoes, and the Starbucks Coffee. And the last slide that I have for you this evening is, you know, what's coming? Because everybody kind of always is interested, well, you know, hey, what plans are coming? And the ones that we can share um, with you tonight is, if you look to the left of the movie theater behind the Krispy Kreme, they've just recently started turning dirt for a 62,000 square foot Academy Sporting Goods store. And then we are in the process of Reviewing plans for a steak and shake that will go behind the Carolina Ale House beside the Hampton Inn and Suites. And the Sports Clips is a um, haircut establishment that's um, going to be in the small building that was um, erected in front of the, the Burlington Coat Factory. That's going to be one of the tenants there. Hungry Howie's, as I'm sure everybody knows, there's already one next to the Lowe's Foods at uh, Western and, and Gum Branch. But they're actually going to... Um, upfit a tenant space at the Piney Green Road Shopping Center. So now there'll be a Hungry Howie's out there at that location. Uh, two Aldi stores. Uh, it's basically an 18,000 square foot grocery store. Mm -hmm. And they're going to open up two locations in Jacksonville as of now. Uh, one is where you see kind of the mound of dirt uh, kind of across from the Krispy Kreme. They basically are surcharging the site in advance of submitting their building plans, which they did this past week. Mm -hmm. Um, so that the soil is compact when they go to establish their, their concrete footing system. They basically, as I understand it, um, they've tweaked their design. They, make the, they made the building six or eight feet wider, and because they made those changes, they had to kind of redesign their building um, accordingly. 
And that's why we've been waiting for those building plans to come in is because they had to redesign them, their architect did. So those plans were submitted this week. And the other item that um, you'll see in the very bottom, there's a large two-story, 47,000 square foot building that is a um, metal building being built behind the Aldi site, behind the optometric eye care to the right of the, the large Marine Federal Credit Union building. That is gonna be a multi-tenant office complex. And right now we have plans in to occupy um, portions of that building by Ortho Wilmington, which is a physician's office. And also the New Hanover Regional Medical Center Physicians Group is going to <coughs> occupy part of that tenant space as well. And I believe that'll leave one or two tenant spaces available for um, any future tenant that may be interested in occupying that space. And that's all that I have for Can you, you this evening. the other location for the Aldi? Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. The second location for the Aldi is going to be located at Richlands Highway and Hickory Road, basically across from the Tractor Supply Company. So that's going to be, you know, a, another grocery store option for the people on the southwest side of town. This would be appropriate if anyone had any questions to ask. This would be a good time to ask them. John, we were talking about glass as far as a building was constructed mm -hmm. to keep uh, builders from not from excluding glass. Why, what's the preference on that? It's an appearance. It's the the design standards, it just boils down to, uh, you know, design standards help dress up the building. With glass? Yes, ma'am. Instead of not just like windows. Mm -hmm. right. Do the older buildings, do they have to comply? Do they have to come to uh, standard, or is just the new buildings that come in? But the old ones, do they have to comply? It's, it's new buildings. There are provisions in the ordinance that deal with the nonconformity uh, section of our ordinance, but it doesn't require that the glazing be added. Now, we wouldn't want to see glazing go away. So if they had 5% of glazing today, and they proposed a modification of the building, we wouldn't want to see them drop below that 5%, but there's not a trigger to make them add the, you know, the extra 8 or 10% um, to get to the standard. So basically new construction. You find glazing. Is that like stucco? A glass. Glass. Even if it's, like the Burlington used faux windows, but I mean, it's, it's glass. It's just they have theirs tinted very dark. Um, because there's actually block behind it. It's actually, there's no wall opening. It's just nothing more than an appearance. Wow. Just to satisfy city code, right? To help, our, <laughs> to, to help the appearance of the community. <laughs> Thank you. To help this committee. This committee. This committee. Whatever happened to murals that they'll talk about one time being painted on the buildings? That's a great question. Ms. Gray and I are actually yeah, working okay. with the Council of Arts folks right now, and hopefully that is something that um, we'll bring forward in the coming months. It kind of, it kind of died down, and, it, and we've kind of um, it ran lit a fire right underneath yeah. that. ran into a road, but it's back on a tape. My school shop had it one time. Yep. There were some nice designs. You remember, you all liked them. And they all seemed to give that great credence there. Yeah, the biggest thing there is um, the difference between a mural and advertising or signage. That's true. So, you know, is it a, a work of art or is it merely a sign? Right. And in downtown, you know, it's, you can have certain things up to a certain percentage, but that percentage may not be large enough. So those are things that we're going to be looking forward to. Uh, looking at as we move forward. Another big challenge is anytime you're using any type of, whether it be advertising or appearance type things with paint, you, you have to be careful that you develop good enforceable standards for maintenance because you don't want something to look great for four, six, or eight months and then all of a sudden it starts deteriorating, uh, it gets tagged with gang symbols or something like that. Somebody has to be responsible for maintaining it. <laughs> okay, at this time we would like to go around the table and have a chance to introduce ourselves so we can start at that corner. Yolanda. Uh, Yolanda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Yolanda, I'm the receptionist at the City Hall. 
and she's helping as our administrative assistant tonight. Right. Thank you. My name is Willie Saunders. I'm a member. Linda Smith, member. Sunshine Williams, a member of the tree board. And I'm Lisa Case, and I'm a guest yes. of <laughs> Sunshine Williams. A citizen of the city. A citizen. <laughs> Concern. <laughs> Concerned citizen. Patrick Carroll, member. Sarah Holland, member. Gina Webb, member. Isaac Hughes, member. Angela Washington, council liaison. Patty Shuffleman, member. Suzanne Nelson, I'm vice chair of this, chair of the tree board, and then planning board liaison. <laughs> Grace Halbert, chairman. I'm Glenn Hargett, staff. Lily Gray, community development. Gary Willett, code enforcement. Ryan King, planning and permit. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'd like to go to Suzanne Nelson on the tree board. All right. Um, as many of you know, we had the Arbor Day ceremony. It was held at Clyde Irwin Elementary. Um, I thought it was phenomenal. We had a lot of student involvement. Um, they helped. Um, we have some pictures. Oh, you do? Oh, <laughs> okay. good. They, uh, with the pledge, and then they, we had two poems. Or it was the same poem that was read. It was done in English and then done in Spanish, so that was pretty neat. Um, the students participated with artwork. They also had... Um, Oh, that's a really good picture. The one that's really good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, the, songs, the songs were really good, and they participated with that, and then also with planting up the trees. So, and our forest stranger this year was very, it was very well spoken, and he did a good job. Does anybody know who this is? I do. Suzanne's son. And we got a lot of good publicity out of it with the Daily News. Mm -hmm. A huge page. <laughs> those pictures were the pictures we the city had taken and put on our Facebook page and offered to them, and so they chose to use those. In the <laughs> <coughs> but um, Suzanne's particularly right. Um, we, we we like our forester. He was <laughs> yes, he, <laughs> he was, was easy to work with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, any time you go to Clyde Earl and Lori Howard and them do a great job yeah. with their students. She they, did, they did a very good job getting everybody prepared and organized, and the kids had to sit there for a good little bit before we got started. And they were well they weren't well yeah. Yeah. We do want to call out Amanda Riapel, um, that's the vice principal there, and she was um, very, very, very helpful in this whole matter. This was the step. Oh, the boys dance. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And then Sunshine had to talk after the boys dance. <laughs> I really like this picture, but this one is. Do y'all know what this recognizes? This was recognizing the 500 trees. One picture each represented 100 trees that your parks division has planted. Wow, so that's That was to recognize that. And then. That's Suzanne's legs. <laughs> I'm going to have to start approving these pictures. <laughs> and the nice thing about these trees, they continued nice. a line that was there. These are these are on school property, mm -hmm. and the others on city property. So it shows that the line is unbroken. Oh, wow. so. were carefully curated <coughs> and then the last picture we love this this kid stayed behind to take care of the next are our staff reports if we can have Patrick Carroll with the recognition subcommittee okay we had we had five nominations for the business parents in the month that, number one then ring seven mm -hmm. University of Mount Owls. This one's Westwood Village. Right. So now we have to vote on <laughs> someone. So we'll take nominations. 
Am I nominated? I nominate for um, the Marine Federal. Yeah. Um, that one and yeah. Buffalo Wild. <coughs> <coughs> Top picks. I'm good with. So yeah, Marine and Buffalo. Anybody else? Okay. How many from Marine Federal? Say, raise your hand. Both of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want both of them? It's a tie. <laughs> okay. No, no, don't pick. Yeah, I know you got to go one or the other. I'm just saying. No, I mean we can, 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 can pick two. Do two. Oh, okay. So you know, two is fine. Both did a good job. I'd give you both of them. Yes. Marine Federal. Buffalo Wings. Your decision. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, next, we have. We'll, a we'll invite them to the June 21st meeting of the City Council to be recognized, unless they can't come, in which we'll move it to the September meeting. The Council, I mean, uh, August meeting. The Council will not meet in a regular session during July. They're scheduled right now only to meet in a workshop session, but that could be Council. So, so that's okay. what I was Go ahead, forgive okay. me. Uh, next, we have the planning subcommittee. Linda? Well, our committee, we did not meet last month. We did complete our April cleanup, and now in our next meeting next month, we're going to start looking at our fall cleanup. <coughs> okay. um, Linda? All right, well, this is where, um, first of all, though, I understand there were some other comments that wanted to be made from our staff friends here. Well, from a code enforcement standpoint, you know, we talk about <clears throat> the city staff and the work we do, but I also wanted to mention that Onslow County government, Onslow County has their planning and zoning and code enforcement or land use section, and they are instrumental in supporting us especially with regards to our extraterritorial jurisdiction or our ETJ. <coughs> uh, we can, our, our, our codes allow us to enforce building codes and minimum housing standards within our ETJ, but a lot of residents uh, with regard to the nuisances, the grass, the weeds, the junk vehicles, illegal dump sites and things of that nature, uh, we don't have policing authority in the ETJ, therefore that portion of the city code cannot be enforced in the ETJ. And when the citizen obviously has a city of Jacksonville address and they will call our office, but when we refer them to the Onslow County Code Enforcement section, uh, these, their professionals over there, their code enforcement officials are instrumental in addressing the same issues we do within the county and they are they're our right hand when it comes to assisting jacksonville residents and of course our wonderful gina <laughs> webb is uh, her day job has her doing that for the county as it is that while she's a city resident she works for it so um <laughs> Now we're talking about committee matters, and you recall that at the advisory um, board um, uh, meeting that you folks have, the strategic planning, you were asked to consider what of those items that were <coughs> highlighted that you wish to work on and to evaluate or to advance. Now this evening you heard some um, you know, work of the staff in doing some of the things that um, um, I think you'll see clearly, as you heard, the Office of Livable Neighborhoods is a direct relation what had happened at the previous um, advisory board um, 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 not calling it summit. summit it was a summit and uh, that we, we got in there sorry I was at a loss there for a moment and um, so now's the point to talk about of those things that you heard or things that you've thought of what are things that you think that the ENA committee should be involved in or to advance more and whether it goes to the planning committee or it goes to recognition or the tree board or whatever there, this is your time that I had something burning I wanted to say about that. This is the time to say that. I hear crickets. <laughs> All right. Well, assuming you don't have anything. We <laughs> need to refresh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we need to be refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was setting those in there, and I thought I was killing too many trees when I had that list in there, but we'll return that to you. Anything that you have that's brought up, and of course there's board member concerns, so you can you can you can bring this up at the end of the meeting there. So I'll just waft right into the um, staff items here. Um, toward the end of that, um, one thing that we're real happy about is you folks were instrumental in and um, in many iterations has been the Lejeune Greenway and Trail 
And um, it is coming along. I think it's going to be something you're going to be very proud of, as it was there. Um, there are already people out using parts of it and such there. Mr. Carroll is there so frequently that uh, he it's worn know, a path there, it, huh? yes. But um, recognize the width of this is not going to be the total width. Um, you know, this is the amount of disturbance of the land there because they're going to make it very zero entry so that, you know, um, handicapped persons can go off the trail and come on the trail and do things like that. So that's why the area of disturbance is a little larger than the southern it's part. Eight feet wide. Yeah. Right now it's paved. <laughs> Smith, Donald, they be. So, and this is where and the bricks will be restored and there'll be a brick crossway here and then this area up in here, this will be cement. In many of the other places of the trail, the trail is asphalt. Mm -hmm. But um, during these parts where they're so close to Memorial, all of that is in cement as it was. And of course, this is going to be what a wonderful view this will be. And <coughs> I think that people will be able to see these memorials and mm -hmm. to be able to um, you know, take their kid on a bicycle there or run there or do whatever they wish to do to get there. Um, this is going to do it. And this, this uh, of course, is the Montford Point Memorial. For those that haven't seen it yet, it's not officially open yet, but um, their dedication ceremony is um, um, July 29th. And um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful memorial. And this is, this is phase one, and they're, they're just now ra they're raising money for phase two and already have more than half the money for phase two. That's so right. they're really doing well on it. But this will be your view as you come up from the Beirut Memorial to go <coughs> to that memorial. And um, I think that that's going to have quite a little opening statement as it was there. Now, toward the other one, um, Patrick Carroll is always on to us about making sure we're taking care of the Beirut Memorial Grove. And I'm, I'm really suspicious that he's not out there inspecting every tree. But um, anyway, this is what it is. And um, it's, um, it's really looking nice. And here's the point. Y'all, a year ago, think about it. A year ago, Michael, Corey taught you about they went to Tennessee, picked out the 300 trees. Remember, they bought 300. <coughs> And remember, they were expecting, you know, a, some mor mortality to occur. You know, simply when you plant 373 trees, you know, something's going to happen. Every one of them is looking, is alive and well so far. Now, there's some adjustments they've made to a couple of them. And um, Patrick, Dr. Carroll there, has made a couple of adjustments himself to a couple of them. Oh, we won. Yeah. Top of the hill. But at the same time, I think this is yeah, remarkable. And I don't know if y'all saw when the when the um, the landscape was on blooming bad. out there as it was. Yeah. That yeah, was a dramatic as it was, too. And um, I want to know that the, the staff for Memorial Day did put flags out. As I was wondering who did that. And, that would um, look so nice mm -hmm. when I rode by yeah. it. And um, I think that's, you know, because they had done it before. Mm -hmm with the, you know, the trees that were in the media. Yes. And so we're not doing those trees anymore. We're going to be doing this. And I think the, the sight of it in mass is just really yeah. amazing. Okay. Just was, right there. So that, that's just, that's a nice thing. I actually mm -hmm. figured Patrick did it not being funny when I drove <laughs> no, by it. I was like, I, oh my I, gosh, I was thinking it was like a 40-foot flag for him. Yeah. 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 The only comment we got was about maybe that we might acquire, because they were nice for the down the center of the road, but acquire a little larger flag. You know, That's what they put a flag pole there. Uh, Glenn, there was, we'll never be able to have a program out there, though, right? No, this is a drive-by. This, this, is, this, is, this is what that is. It's, it's, it's intended to be that, and... Um, you know, this was this was an area that was. Remember, it was surplus to the DOT, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it was never intended. And <coughs> the only driveway out there that's now well worn by some people and others, you know, <laughs> that is, um, you know, is for maintenance purposes. Now they are bearing the line. You might have noticed that the line runs to the pumps for the irrigation. Um, they have now buried that. So to make it have a little better appearance to it. What about the signage? That is um, the <laughs> signage is in development okay. for consideration. So I hope next time y'all meet, y'all get to look at it. <laughs> uh, next, we have the planning advisory board. Ryan, um, Ryan handled all of that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> he nailed it. <laughs> it's good when you get other people to do your work. Yes. <laughs> Are there any comments? Members? Well, then. My gosh, y'all are usually yes. much more. <laughs> I have one, one question for Gary. Yes, ma'am. When you mention um, the dandelions, do you have a diagnosis <laughs> or 
a liquid that will kill them? <laughs> no, ma'am, but we do have a horticulturist on staff, and if you would like, I'll get you his information, and he's the duty expert on everything growing <laughs> and dying. <laughs> and you might check with the master gardeners out there at the extension service. Yeah, they, they, they've got some more. Scott Long, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's no other comments, is there a motion to adjourn? So oh. <laughs> second. Second. Okay. Uh, then this is uh, the end of our meeting. Our next meeting is August 4th. Um, 6 p.m. See you then. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank